Okay. So this morning, um, we're going to focus on when to treat. So um, during this talk, I'm going to cover some of the useful resources that can help you get started with identifying when to treat. And we're going to look at those features on trees and the buds and the twigs and the bark that can help you um, along your way to identify, identifying a tree. And we're also going to look at a suite of common species um, that you're most likely to encounter and some of those distinctive features that you can look out for. So at the outset, I want to make clear what our focus is today. So we're looking really at those broadleaf species um, that lose their leaves during the winter period. So we're not including broad leaves that retain their leaves during winter, such as holly, and we're not including those conifers, such as larch, um, that lose their needles during winter. So we're only, our pure focus is those broad leaf deciduous trees and some of the larger shrubs. So during the summer, um, identification of trees is perhaps reasonably straightforward. You've got leaves and you've often got flowers to look at, but in the winter, those features are absent. So what is it we can rely on for identification? Um, well, we have the overall form of the tree. So the outline, the silhouette. Um, we can also look at the bark. That can be useful in some instances. Uh, and there's also twigs and buds to look at. Um, and in some cases, you'll get fruits and seeds. Um, however, the keys tend to focus on the centre too, so the bark and the twigs. That's because these are the features that are persistent throughout the winter period and are persistent on most species and on most specimens. So the outline can be useful, the form of the tree can be useful um, in certain circumstances. But if you've got a tree growing in the middle of a woodland where it's got competition from other species, the form may be different than if it's a single tree out in a parkland. Also, we manage trees, we, we coppice them, um, we prune them. And so the form can be modified through those activities. So it's not the most reliable feature to go on. Likewise, fruits, they may be present on some trees at some time, time of the year, but uh, not consistently throughout the winter. Um, so it can be helpful in some cases, but not reliably so. So our focus really is the buds and the shoots and the bark. Those are the things that we can look at. So this slide shows you some of the equipment you're going to need if you want to look at wind trees. Uh, many of the features are, avail um, are visible to the naked eye, but a hand lens makes it so much easier. Um, if you're going to look at features of the, the buds, um, you really need a hand lens and ideally a times 20 hand lens for field work. I find an LED flashlight um, invaluable. Um, this um, shown on the left. Um, this is great, um, particularly if you need to look at hairs on buds or any, any tiny feature like the number of scales, for example, that is really useful and can, of course can be used for other um, organisms as well, not just winter trees. When you're using a key, many of the features you need to look at size, so of course you need a rule. Um, binoculars are also useful. Um, the features such as buds and so on, are not always accessible to you. So binoculars are useful in that respect. Likewise, if you're going to take any specimens, you're going to need a pair of secateurs. And I also recommend a notebook and a map or a GPS so that you can record your observations and make useful wildlife records afterwards as well. If you're going to identify anything, you need some kind of identification book or guide, field guide. These two are brilliant for the beginners, both published by the Field Studies Council. Um, the one on the left is a photographic guide um, and it covers um, fewer species than the one on the right. 
but it's fully illustrated. So if you're an absolute beginner, you may find that useful. It will cover the most common species you're likely to encounter. Uh, the one on the right, uh, that doesn't include any colour photos, but it includes detailed line drawing and it's set out really like a key, a dichotomous key. So if you're not familiar with these, um, it asks you pairs of questions, if you like, on which you compare your specimen to and you decide which of those two options your uh, specimen fits. And you work your way through the pairs of questions until you get the answer as to what your tree is. That has the advantage of covering more species, over 70. Um, so that I would recommend probably the one on the right if you want um, really to start looking at your trees and shrubs in winter. Both are small, small guides, easily portable in the field and relatively cheap. However, if you want to take things further, so say you want to survey more comprehensively, you're going to come across many exotic trees that have been planted or introduced, and those just won't be covered by your field study council guides. So you're going to need something with more species. And I would heartily recommend John Poland's book um, here on the left. Uh, this is quite recent, only two years old, and it's been reprinted this year. This covers more than 400 species that you'll find in the UK. So really, will cover anything you're likely to come across. It's beautifully illustrated. There's photos of the buds and twigs of all the species, um, coloured plates. And again, it's set out as a key, uh, series of keys. Um, so that can help you um, with your, obviously with your identification. And throughout the keys, there are line drawings as well of the specimens. So that's a great book. Um, I would, as I say, if you're seriously wanting to look at winter trees, that's the one I would go for. Um, I can't really talk about winter trees without mentioning Schultz's book. Um, this is hugely comprehensive, so it covers over 700 species, but critically, it's not specific to the UK, so um, it's specific to temperate woodlands. Uh, this, however, is beautifully again illustrated with paintings of the twig, twigs, um, but it's not really a field guide. So it's it's a big book. It's not going to be something you're carrying in your backpack. So that's really one as a reference guide, and the cost also is uh, higher on that one. When you're thinking about trees, don't forget your ordinary tree book field guides, um, such as the Collins Guide. Um, that's still useful and you'll find many of the tree guides actually have a section on winter twigs. Um, but what it gives you as well is it has information on distribution, so little maps of where the tree is typically found, which your tree twig books don't have. And also it covers things like bark and the form of the trees, which are all useful um, when you're looking at trees in winter. So I wouldn't forget about your ordinary tree guides as well. So when learning to identify anything, um, it's really useful to think about what you're likely to see where you live or where you're looking. And this is where data comes in. Um, there are a couple of online resources which you'll find really useful. Um, one on the right is the MBN Atlas Scotland, and the one on the left is the BRC's Plant Atlas. So MBN Atlas Scotland, it covers more than just trees, it covers everything. So organisations like TWIC upload data to the Atlas and make it available nationally. So you can use that as a useful resource for your recording, um, to check the distribution of a particular tree. So if you've keyed something out, you're not quite sure if your identification is correct, um, you can common sense check it using these resources, because if it's something that's only found in southwest Scot uh, say southwest of England, and you're in Scotland, um, it's perhaps unlikely or less likely that it's correct. Um, the Big advantage to 
the BRC site is that it links to the BSBI database. So if you have a look on the slide on the left hand side, you'll see I've got the page up for field maple Acer compestry. And you can see there's a little dot map bottom right. And there's a link there to the interactive map. And this links to the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland's database. Um, for those of you who don't know, BS, BSBI is the national recording scheme for vascular plants um, in the UK. So the comprehensive place to go to if you, um, if you need to know about uh, plant distribution. So the great thing is from the BRC site, it links to this public view um, of the, the database. So you can check in real time, well, not quite real, real time, but up to 2020, you can see records for 2020 on the map already. Um, so this is much more up to date than the Atlas, for example, where there's a delay in uploading the data. This takes you to what's on their database now. Um, so a fantastic resource, um, as I say, for checking um, the current distribution of various trees. And you can zoom in and out to see um, what records there are of a particular tree for your area. Um, I should say that at public view, you don't get record details on here. Um, you need to be a BSBI member or have been granted access um, to their database to get the full record details. But nevertheless, even at public view, this is a useful resource to give you the overall distribution um, of that species. OK, so now you've got your equipment sorted and hopefully a good ID book behind you. Um, we can start thinking about um, identification, which is, of course, why you're here. The first thing to note is that when you're identifying winter trees um, and you're looking at buds and shoots, you want to be looking at the last year's growth. So the last season of growth. And that's usually the tip of the tree uh, twig branch. So you can see here. So this is one year old. And the features in the keys will predominantly refer to these, uh, this part of the tree. So with identification, we always have a whole new set of terms to get to grips with. Um, these help us describe the tree, uh, parts of the tree, um, and they're also used in the keys. So it's worth learning these terms. Um, however, most of the guides do have glossaries, so you can go and look them up. If you don't you can't remember what a lent cell is and it's used in the key, you can go and look it up. That's not a problem. So what parts do you need to know? Right, first of all, <clears throat> where the buds arise on the twig, these are referred to as nodes. So these buds are going to develop into either flowers, leaves, or a new shoot. So the portion of the stem of the tree here, the twig, between two nodes is referred to as an internode. And we have two kinds of buds. We have buds that occur at the tip of the tree, uh, tip, of, tip of the uh, twig, like here. And this is referred to as a terminal bud. And then we have buds that arise along the, um, the side of the shoot. So these are lateral buds here. And the size and the features of these may differ. The next term for you to think about is lenticels, right? These are effectively breathing pores um, on the, uh, in the bark um, of the twig. And you can see in this species, they're quite prominent. They almost look like warts and they're quite raised. Um, the shape of lenticels will, however, vary and the size varies. So it might be almost like a speck, a small dot on the, on the bark. But generally speaking, lenticels will be a different sort of colour to the background colour of the twig, so you can recognise them that way. But they may be round, they may be almost like a little, little line dash. So, 
So the developing bud is protected by a number of modified leaves, and these we refer to as bud scales. And we can see in the species there are one, two, three, four, five bud scales, probably covering that. Well, there'll be one on the other side as well, or six. And these, as I say, modified leaves, and they protect the developing bud from um, drying out and from damage. And most trees will have these scales or a number of these scales. The number will vary, the colour varies, etc. Um, but most species have them. There are a few species, however, where these scales appear to be actually lacking, um, as in here, where, as you can see, it, this is the developing leaf and it's just folded up. There's nothing covering that. So in that instance, we would refer to them as naked buds because they lack these protective scales. So where these uh, bud scales fall off, um, you're left with bud scale marks. And these are just um, marks on the twig uh, of a different color to the rest of the twig. And in this case, you can see this bud actually developed into a new shoot rather than a leaf. And so those are the bud scale scars there. Likewise, where the leaf dies and falls off, that leaves a mark on the twig below the bud, and this is called a leaf scar. And again, the shape, size, etc., of those can vary. Generally speaking, the scar is larger where a larger leaf has um, died. So if you think of something like a horse chestnut or even an ash, where you've got a larger size leaf, therefore the PTL holding that leaf is larger, the, the stalk of the leaf. Therefore, the, where it falls off, and the mark is larger as well. Okay. So when you get started with the keys, um, particularly the ADAP key, that's the Field Study Council key, um, the first thing that they'll ask you is how are your buds arranged on the twig? So broadly speaking, we have two, maybe three different types that we can recognize. The first of these, the buds appear in opposite pairs along the twig, as in the left uh, image. Uh, the second arrangement is an alternative arrangement. So you can see the buds alternate on either side of the twig. And this often leads to the twig looking a bit zigzag. And then finally, we have some species that it's not strictly alternate, it's perhaps more spiral. So you can see the buds go round and round the twig. Um, so you can see, for example, you've got buds on the side, almost like alternate, but then you've got one on the underside, uh, on the opposite side that we are here. Hopefully you can see my mouse. So this is called spiral, but often alternate and spiral are lumped together. So what I want to do now is take you through some of the most common species um, that you're likely to encounter and go through their different features. So the first set of trees we're going to look at have um, buds that are in opposite pairs like this. And the first two we're going to look at um, effectively the bud scales are absent or very reduced so they look absent. So the first two have effectively naked, naked buds. And the first of these is dogwood. So common and uh, something you should be able to pick out easily in the countryside um, because it's got such vibrant red shoots at this time of year. In the summer, it looks pr pretty ordinary with the green leaves, and it, but it's really in the winter that it, it comes alive and you see these. Um, blood red shoots. Um, this is a species uh, that's commonly planted, however, so there are a number of cultivars that you need to be aware of. And um, so if it doesn't fit the classic native dogwood, then uh, perhaps look at one of the cultivars. However, as I say, alternate buds, uh, not alternate, 
opposite buds in pairs along the shoot. And you can see the developing leaves. Um, this is the terminal bud. Not really, I mean, the scales, there are two small scales, but they're hardly noticeable. And bearing in mind, this is largely um, blown up for you. Um, if you're looking at the real life specimen, these would be quite small and not very noticeable. So the other thing to note about dogwood is it suckers. So you'll see large um, patches of this um, growing um, in the wild. Okay, so the next tree we'll look at is the elder um, or elderberry. Um, you'll be familiar perhaps with the lovely white um, flowers that this has in the summer that you can make elderflower cordial out of. And of course, it has those lovely black berries that the birds are so fond of in the um, autumn. But in the winter, what does it look, what are you looking for? Well, the um, barks are quite cork-like and rough. And the twigs have these wart-like lenticels on them, uh, which make it look quite uh, knobbly in a way. And the buds are quite amazing too. They're purple. Um, quite ragged. They do have some scales, but they're hardly, bud scales, but they're hardly noticeable. Uh, very rugged looking. Some people compare it to a pineapple, pineapple shape, um, but quite amazing. So these, um, these are the buds, again in pairs. And this is a species that breaks into leaf quite early in the season. Um, so now is a good time of year if you want to go and look at the buds. Um, too late in the season, sort of towards end of Sort of February, March, they'll already be breaking into leaf. Okay, so the next um, set of trees we're looking at, again, they have opposite buds. Um, but in this instance, the leaf scars are quite large um, and quite visible. So the next four we're looking at have these larger leaf scars. The first of these is ash and it has relatively few bud scales and um, you can hardly make out the scales and um, there are so few but it's really quite distinctive it has this pale um, gray um, twig and um, bark and these black very black um, ash black you might say tw uh, twigs um, so that's one you're not likely to confuse with anything else you also see at this time of year um, ash keys on the uh, trees. So they're something we could look for, um, or the remains of those. Um, but as I say, the leaf scar is quite big and also uh, sort of crescent shaped, you might say. Another very distinctive uh, species is the horse chestnut tree. Uh, these buds are very large, so up to three centimetres and distinctively sticky, sticky buds. Um, the leaf scars are also quite distinctive, so they're shield shape um, and they have these raised dots on them, um, which gives the overall impression of some kind of like horseshoe really. Um, so those are really distinctive. But again, another species that has paired um, opposite buds on the tree. Of course, the other feature you can look for is um, the, the fruit. So um, you're looking for conkers, which are covered in quite a spiny case. Uh, okay, so the next one to look at is, um, we're looking at two aces. So both sycamore and Norway maple. They're quite alike. The buds are fairly similar size, um, but there are differences. So you can see straight away that the color of the scales is quite different. In the sycamore, you have these green scales with um, darker edges, whereas in the Norway maple, we have these reddish buds. Um, be warned though that 
that um, where there's poor light, the underside of Norway maple buds can be greenish. Um, so it, you often see that it'll be red above and a bit green below where the light can't get at it. Other differences we can look for. So the twig of sycamore is greyish, um, whereas in Norway, Norway maple, it's brownish. In terms of the bud arrangement, they're both in opposite pairs. Um, terminal buds, in sycamore you can have one or two terminal buds, um, plus a couple of smaller buds that go either side here. In the normal maple, we usually only have one terminal bud with the two smaller buds either side. Now, as I say, um, the seeds or fruits are not entirely reliable in terms of they're not there all year round. But if you do have them, um, there are differences between sycamore and Norway maple. So the sycamore has um, uh, the aeroplanes, if you like, that have an acute angle between the two pairs. Um, whereas in the Norway maple, the angle between them is wider, so more obtuse. So you can tell them apart that way as well. Now to complete the maple set, um, the other common uh, maple you might come across is the field maple. Um, and this is often um, seen in hedgerows or hedgerow trees. And it's quite different actually from the uh, Norway maple and the sycamore in the size of the buds is about half the size. So if you look at sycamore and Norway maple, these are up to a centimetre big. Uh, whereas if you look at the field maple, these are only up to half a centimetre. So quite small, really. The other key difference between them is that the field maple has hairy um, buds, or at least hairs at the tip of the buds. Um, whereas sycamore and Norway maple have hairless buds, so they look quite shiny. You'll also notice the colour is quite different. So it's it's darker, it's browner, browner looking, but like um, the sycamore and Norway maple, it has these smaller buds near the tip and it has the same opposite arrangement of buds on the twig. For completeness, I've shown you um, the seed, and you can see in this case, the angle is really wide. It's almost like a straight line. So if you compare that to the Norway maple and the sycamore, it's quite um, different. Um, and you can use that if, um, if you've got them available to you. Okay, so that completes the set of um, tree species with um, opposite buds. We now move on to alternate buds. So the first ones I want to show you um, have few bud scales. So this makes the bud look quite smooth. Um, as you can see with the line, you can only really make out two scales on there. Now I'm calling this line um, rather than a particular species because the three lines that we typically get, the large leaf line, the small leaf line and the common line are quite similar. And moreover, the, the common line is actually a hybrid between the other two. So there is some, well, they're quite similar um, and therefore not straightforward always to identify. Um, however, all the lines share uh, this feature of having alternately arranged buds, often quite reddish looking, particularly if it's in the light, sunlight. Um, where it's more shaded, it will look perhaps greener, and you'll sometimes see the twig is red above and green underneath. And these are typically planted um, in this area. However, if you do want to have an attempt at telling them apart, one of the key um, things to look for um, is what we call epicormic groups. So if you've got 
all of these shoots, loads and loads of shoots at the base of the trunk, then it's pretty likely you've got common line because um, small leaf lime doesn't really have this. Um, and large leaf lime might have a few, uh, but not an abundance like this. So that's a key feature for you to look for, um, which can help you tell them apart. If you use Poland's book, um, the way he separates the limes is he looks, one of the features he uses is to look at the internode length. So the distance between the different, between the buds. So these are the nodes. And in common line, that distance is longer than the other two. So it's between five and 10 centimetres. Um, whereas in small leaf line and large leaf line, the internode distance is less, less than four centimetres. So you can separate them on that basis. Hairiness varies, so I won't go into that. Um, not entirely reliable, I'd say. Um, but there are other features, of course, you, you should, with identification, you should use all the features available to you. Um, and that feature might include, in fact, roots. Okay, they may not be there the whole year. At the moment, you can still find them. So that could be useful. Or even if they're not on the tree, look around the base of the tree and you'll still find the remains. And that is the second feature you can use to help you decide what species of lime you've got. So in the common line, um, these fruits are hairy um, and hardly ribbed, um, faintly ribbed. In the large leaf line, they're likewise hairy, so downy, um, but they've got strong ribs visible. So that's the difference between those two. Small leaf line is perhaps the simplest one to tell apart with the fruits because its fruits are hairless and hardly ribbed at all. Um, so that could be separated out much more easily. But as I say, for common line, the best thing, if you've got a nice mature tree like this, is to look for these epicormic shoots um, and then look at the twigs in more detail. Check the internode length. Have you got seeds? It all helps build up the evidence to help you um, decide on your identification. Okay, so the next of our alternate um, arranged um, buds is the older. And the older is beautiful, I think, um, because it has these lovely mauve buds, so beautiful, um, but distinctive as well, actually, because this is one of the few trees that we have um, where lateral buds are actually on stalks. You can see that here on the left. That's quite unusual. You don't get many trees that have stalk buds. So that combined with this lovely colour and perhaps the fact that older tends to grow in wetter places, so along the river sides and so on, um, that can help you um, identify this species. The number of scales, as you can see, uh, you can hardly make out the scales um, from this image, but there are two to three um, if you look closely. The other feature, of course, about older is um, it will have catkins over the winter and you'll still be able to find the cones. So these are the female catkins, effectively. So they're quite distinctive. Um, I've put in a warning here on the right hand side that there are two other species of older that are introduced and planted in our area. And so there is potential confusion with these. Now, how do you tell them apart? Well, perhaps most straightforward um, for Italian older is that the cones are much larger. They're the largest of any older, and they're perhaps up to twice the size of the um, common older cones, the native older. So they can be up to three centimeters long. So that's a nice distinctive feature that can perhaps give you a pointer that you're looking at not the native older. For grey older, um, the feature to look at, um, you might look at, is the fact that it has hairy shoots. So if you've got hairs on here, then you may be looking at grey older rather than um, older. 
there are more subtle differences in the bud color and so on. Um, and obviously, if you were looking at it, you'd want to look at all the features available. But as I say, gray older, hairy twigs, Italian older, very large cones. That should um, point you in the right direction. And also context, are you near an urban area? Is it likely people have planted things? Or are you in the middle of the wilds where it's most likely to be um, the native? Okay, so we're going to move on now uh, to clustered buds. So there are a couple of genre of trees that have um, this arrangement where you can see there's a whole load of buds clustered. Now these vary um, depending on whether they're on side shoots, short side shoots like this, um, and it would have single buds at the end, the terminal. Um, terminal buds, or the clustered buds can be at the tips of twigs like this on the right. And depending on whether you've got this arrangement on the left or this arrangement on the right, you might be looking at two different trees, uh, two different genre of trees. If you've got lateral buds clustered, you're li more likely to be looking at a cherry. Whereas if you've got clustered buds, um, at the, the tips, you're most likely to be looking at the oaks. But you can see in other respects, the colour of the buds, the shape of the buds is very similar. They both have quite a large number of bud scales. Um, so really, where are those clusters if you see them? Are they at the tips or are they on the side shoots? And that should give you a clue. The second really helpful clue to tell the two apart is cherries have quite distinctive bark. Um, <clears throat> so they have these linear lens cells that go across the trunk and the bark often flakes, peels back. And this is a cherry, whereas your oak, um, the bark is quite different, greyish um, and peeling into plates like this. So you've established you've got a cherry rather than an oak. Um, where do you go from there? Right. Well, I've put cherries in, uh, in as in the group because unfortunately there are a lot of planted and cultivated cherries that you might come across. Um, so it's not entirely straightforward. However, this photo here shows the wild cherry. Um, which is one of the native species you might come across. And in this case, you could see the remains of fruits. And that would give you the clue, a clue that this is the wild cherry, as opposed to, say, bird cherry, where the fruit, uh, the flowers and therefore the fruits are arranged differently. Um, however, getting to cherry is your first stage. And even in poor light, where you can't see the buds very well, you can see um, up against the sky, the silhouette of the side shoots, you can see quite clearly these clustered buds. So you should be able to get to cherry quite readily. Um, and then I would advise you to look at Poland and look at the differences, um, the more subtle differences there, to decide what sort of cherry you have. So regarding oaks, um, as I said um, before, the buds are clustered at the tips of shoots here. And there are two oaks you're most likely to come across, the English oak and the sepoil oak. However, we do have a hybrid um, where these two species have interbred and produced a tree which is intermediate in characters between the other two. However, um, <coughs> if you want to tell them apart or try to tell them apart, uh, one of the things you need to look at is the bud scales and it's a matter of counting bud scales. Have you got more than 20 bud scales or less than 20 bud scales? Um, that is one of the ways to tell them apart. If you've got more than 20, uh, you're looking at sessile oak um, and if you've got less than 20, you're looking at English oak, likely. Other differences to help tell them apart 
Um, English oak tends to have hairless buds, um, where sessile oak has more hairs on them. Um, and you can also, of course, look for acorns. So as the name suggests, um, sessile refers to a lack of a stem, um, and that refers to the acorn. So the acorn is on stalkless um, shoots, whereas your English oak, um, which is a pedunculate oak, has a long stalk to the acorn. Um, so if you have acorns available, that can help you decide which type of oak you have. But unfortunately, your specimen might not fit either English or sessile, in which case it's quite probable you're looking at a hybrid, which is somewhere in between the other two. Okay, so we're now moving on to species that have alternate buds. Um, but this time, the buds are quite long and narrow. Um, so they're slender buds. So we've got a couple of species I want to show you. Uh, the first of these is the common beech. So <clears throat> in the common beech, um, the bark is grey and smooth. Uh, and the buds are quite long and thin and brown, brown red colour, and they have quite a large number of scales. So if you were to get your hand lens out on this, you'd probably have around 20 scales covering that bud. The distinctive thing about this is the bud is pointing away from the shoot. So unlike something like the hornbeam, which is superficially similar, that bud lies flat against the twig. So that's how you can tell that part. It also is shorter. For the beech, you'll also find um, you might have beech mass left on the tree. That tends to persist. Um, so that's a feature you can look for. <clears throat> Another feature of beech, um, which is fairly unusual, is that the leaves, the dead leaves, are often retained on young parts. Um, young shoots so you may actually find that the leaves are still on there throughout the winter okay we then move on to the birches these are classified as slender buds again because the buds are longer than they are wide but unlike beech these are much smaller buds um, if you look less than a centimetre long. Now, um, to tell the silver birch from the downy birch, you want to look at the shoot and you want to see if it's hairy or not or warty or not. If you have a shoot that's hairless and warty, you're most likely looking at silver birch. Whereas if you've got a shoot that's hairy with no warts, then it's going to be downy birch. The bark is a second backup feature that you can look for. Um, in the silver birch, the bark develops into this um, silvery colour with triangular or diamond shaped marks on it. Um, whereas the downy birch never really gets developed those marks or peels as much. Now you'll note I've put an hybrid, and unfortunately this is another set of trees that will mix and interbreed, so you can get hybrids. Um, the other flaw with the hairy, not hairy, warty, not warty feature is unfortunately saplings of silver birch can be hairy, so you need to watch out for that. Uh, likewise, vigorous shoots of silver birch can also be hairy. Um, so you can't rely on that alone, um, or at least look at several twigs, don't just look at one twig, um, and also look at the bark um, in combination. Of course, for this tree, the growth form is very useful as well. Um, so as the Latin names infer, silver birch, that's Betula pendula, uh, the younger twigs 
will hang down, weep. Um, whereas weeping, really, downy birch doesn't weep much at all. Um, so that is one way you can tell, help tell them apart. Um, so don't just rely on one feature as the take home message. Look at the buds, look at the trunk and look at the growth form in combination and then reach a decision. And if it's confusing, maybe you have a hybrid. Okay, so we've looked at slender buds. Now we're looking at what I'd call squat buds. So these are again alternate on the stem, um, but they're much um, much less long. So they're they're not quite as wide as long, um, but they're getting on towards it. And hazel is a species that you'll very commonly encounter. Um, the buds are small maybe only half a centimetre long, but they're green uh, with um, several bud scales, so you can see three here. And the twigs are generally hairy. Um, if you get your hand lens out, you'll actually see gland tip hairs with little red tips. So you can have a look for that. So that's quite a good feature to look at. Also, hazels are coppiced, so you may see they've been cut down back hard and then you've got regrowth. This is also a tree that tends to have catkins um, present during the winter months. So you can look for those too. They'll burst um, in the spring, but even during the winter, they'll be developing. And this photo on the right shows you the female flower, which is absolutely tiny but quite beautiful. Um, as you can see, it's slightly smaller than the bud, I would say. Um, and these are the styles, these red bits are the styles. Right, well, our final tree to look at is the elm, specifically the witch elm. Again, squat buds, tiny buds very tiny buds, half a centimetre long, um, but quite dark um, and hairy. It can in fact have red, red rufous coloured hairs on here. And you can also see hairs along the edge of the bud scales here and here. So that's a feature to look for. There are a couple of other elms you might encounter, um, English elm, for example, um, the witch elm has rougher twigs and there are differences in the bud as well. Um, but another feature that's quite useful is suckering or not suckering. So witch elm tends not to sucker, well it doesn't sucker, whereas English elm does. So you can help, you can tell them apart that way. But really tiny buds, you really need your hand lens for this and especially if you want to look at the hairs. Um, the other feature I omitted to notice, I said it was bumpy, but and that's because the, the hairs, the base of the hairs have these raised areas, um, and that's what you can make out here, sort of little pimples. So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour through um, some of the common uh, trees and shrubs you're likely to encounter. But I hope it's shown you that they can be um, worth, they're worth our study and they're quite distinctive and beautiful as well. Um, really, if you're identifying winter uh, trees, the twigs and buds are key to identification. Um, however, use all of that um, information that's available to you if you have fruits, um, if you have other features um, present, do use them because it all builds out um, your body of evidence to decide what sort of tree you have. As I say, I've only covered a selection of trees in this, um, in this session. I've not included, for example, all those species that have thorns um, or prickles. So that would be another talk, I think. Um, but hopefully by learning some of the more common ones, um, you'll then start to see if a tree looks different and 
you can go away and use one of the books to help you identify them. A health warning is that in urban areas, there are many, many other species and you'll come across cultivars and all sorts of things. So I think for the beginner, the best thing to do is to go somewhere sort of semi-natural along, you know, the riverside, woodlands, that sort of thing, where the number of species you're likely to encounter is a bit smaller. So you can get to grips with the common species first um, before heading into areas where you're likely to come across many, many different trees. Arboreta are uh, brilliant in that, of course, you have labelled trees um, to look at. So you can test your knowledge um, um, at these places. Obviously, COVID restrictions allow them. Um, we've got two um, Arboretum, at least two in our area. So RBG, RBGE in Edinburgh and Doig Botanic Gardens. So they may be well worth a visit if you want to study your trees. And just to finally say um, that you can help build our knowledge of, wind, of trees in this country. So you can contribute sightings to TWIC and the BSBI um, just by noting what you've seen, where you've seen it and the date. And if you want more information on that, if you go to our website, there's some guidelines on contributing data. OK, I will stop there and we can take questions.